Long to. You know, how, how can you not want to sing about a God who's so incredible? Amen. How could you not? And so it's something He's given us. He's given us to, to sing. And happy people sing. That's why they sing. And I'm glad you guys get up. Uh, we learned a lot of stuff singing. I, I learned, uh, it's the first time I ever heard that song Jane sang this morning. And, uh, but that was a blessing. I like to hear new songs, some stuff I hadn't heard in a while or something like that. Some of the songs that Dolly used to sing, good night, I hadn't heard that since I was a kid. And it just brought back a flood of memories sitting in that old church and uh, just people get up and singing. So it's a blessing. You guys keep up the good work. And uh, it's a blessing to, to your preacher's heart. And I hope it's a blessing to your brethren. If it's not, it's their fault, not yours. You just keep singing for God's glory. Um, listen, I, I believe this with all my heart. I believe when a person gets up, puts their heart into it, no matter what they sound like, and a person can get up and sing uh, as uh, an angel, and their heart not be in it. And listen, one of them gets a reward, and it's not the one that didn't have the heart in it. Right? God's looking at the heart. He sees through all what man thinks is good. The Bible says that which is highly esteemed uh, uh, um, among men is an abomination with God. So men esteem certain things. They esteem a certain look. They esteem a certain sound and sound quality and all this other stuff. Um, God's not interested in that. He's looking at a heart that's willing to do something for him. That's what he's looking at. He'll use that heart every time. So... Um, I got a, a question. I don't know if I still have it in my wallet or not, but I got one in the offering plate here. I don't know where it went. I don't know. I got All I got is these receipts. So, receipts for everything. I usually give them, when they get this thick, I usually give them to my wife. But it, it's okay. Um, I got one regarding what do I teach uh, as far as tithing goes. And so, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have a problem telling you what I teach, um, but at the same time, uh, you'll not hear me preach a lot about money. You just won't. And uh, there's enough on TV. If you want to hear some preaching about money, just turn on a TV preacher and listen to him when he says give, give to the church, don't give to him. So, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Lighten up a little bit. L listen to me. Um, there's a lot of false teachings on giving, and it's to beat people over the head about giving, and uh, I'm not one of them types. This is what I figure. If I get to the heart of the matter, which is getting your heart right with God about how you're living, that will never be an issue in your life, because when you realize the depth of what he's done for you, it'll never be an issue, never be an issue. You'll want to support the church. You'll want to be a blessing. You'll want to help brethren who have needs. It ain't Giving ain't just about these light bills here. It ain't. Listen, there's missionaries on them foreign fields that depend on us every month. They're in a, a, on a field that they can't work. They can't labor, some of them. They go there and try to labor, then, then, then they have to go home because that country don't want you taking their money. You have to have some kind of skill, English or something like that. So a lot of them can't. They, they don't have the option to work. Or even if they worked, it would be a bad testimony because the people there are so poor. You know, and you would be taking one of their jobs. So, um, and we want to be a good testimony. Um, if you'll go to Malachi, I'm going to go to probably the most famous verse. And you'll be happy to know I don't teach it the way um, other preachers do it because I think that this... The way they preach it is, is out of context. And uh, there's a principle taught with tithing that I appreciate. I'm grateful for. And uh, we, can, we can glean from those principles. They're, they're good principles. Malachi chapter number 3. I want you to see Malachi 3. You probably, you probably heard uh, messages on God robbers and um, you know, you're robbing God. How can you rob somebody who owns a cattle on a thousand hills? Now, I'm going to say this from the standpoint of what God is saying here. You've got to read it in this context. And so I want to emphasize some things in Malachi here. Malachi here. Do you think God needs your money? 
He don't need your money. He don't need your money at all. What He's doing is giving you an opportunity to get a blessing and a reward for being faithful to take care of the needs. Listen, He don't need your money. He's trying to include you so that... I'm not saying... Listen, I'm not necessarily talking about monetary blessing. I'm not, I'm not saying there is a principle of sowing and reaping. There is still a principle. But uh, I'm not one that would promote covetous in you, covetousness in you and tell you to give so you can get. That's garbage. That's garbage. Let me tell you what, that kind of doctrine is garbage. You need to give so that you can be a blessing and expect not a thing back. You need to give because of what was already given to you and that is just forgiveness of sin. Hey, listen, if you didn't get no more than that in your life, if you didn't get another penny for what you gave to the church, and you could escape uh, the flames of hell, what difference would it make? You ain't going. You ain't going to perish. <laughs> so you don't... Listen, above that, I, I look at it like this. If he don't ever give me another thing, I ain't going to hell. And that was a, that was a wonderful gift he gave me, and that's forgiveness. And then I get all the other stuff he's promising me on top of that. And who, who, whoever would dream that God love us so much He'd give us a mansion in His presence? I, do you know who I am? Do you know what I've done? That's the way I feel. But listen, how we, we can't outgive Him. We can't. And listen, um, but the principles that are taught here, if you're not careful... Um, a lot of preachers, you know why I'm comfortable working a job? It's not because I don't want to be able to, they say full-time. <laughs> what does that mean? I'm full-time everything. We, we should be full-time Christians. I'm, I don't believe in part-time Christians. We, we should be full-time our heart in the gospel. We should be full-time, what is this? Are you full time? And I, asked, and I heard a guy say uh, this week. Bucky sent me a little thing. Uh, he, he says, "I'm. Uh, are you bivocational?" It's like, listen, listen. Does, if you're saying I work, li listen, y'all, listen, y'all. Did Peter? Did Paul? Well, let's say this. Paul, we know for sure. Did Paul work? Peter, we knew what he did. Did Did Paul work? Did, um, uh, did, did uh, Priscilla and Aquila work? They had a church in their house. Did they work? They were all tent makers. Did Peter, James, did Peter and that crowd, did they work? They were all fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector. You know, Luke was a physician. And you know what? They still preached the gospel. Some of them were still over churches. It's okay. I, I, I'm... I'm not saying you'll be better off. You'll be better off if, in a lot of ways if your pastor does not have to work a secular job. He has more time to study. He has more time to visit. Um, but I want you to understand my heart in it. I got no issue with working. I don't want to be a burden to the church at all. I don't want to be a burden. The least burden I can be to you, um, that's, that's where I want it to be. And... Um, it, it's better that way. It's a better testimony all the way around. Biggest accusation you get against a pastor is he's just in it for the money. I promise you one thing, you'll never get that impression from me. That's right. Never. I, I don't want anybody to ever make that accusation against me. I'm not in it for the money. But these principles are, are principles that got to be taught. They have to be taught. Look at uh, Malachi chapter number 3 verse 8. He says, Will a man rob God, uh, yet ye have robbed me, but you say, when have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, let me stop before we go any further. What nation is he talking about? Is he talking about the United States of America? Is he talking about Russia or China or what nation is he talking about? 
It's the nation of Israel. Listen to me, brethren. I have talked to you over and over about rightly dividing. We went as a sample, the Sabbath, about rightly dividing the Sabbath. I am not against the principle of tithe as a tenth, showing and illustrating a goal we should set for ourselves. I'm not against that. But you're not going to get me to stand up here and say, if you don't, you're robbing God, because this passage here is not written to the church. This passage is written to a nation, and the tithe was taken up for a particular reason, if you read about it. And let me say something to you. Most people who believe in a tithe don't really believe in Old Testament giving to begin with. Because when we start reading, you're going to see it wasn't only a tithe, but it was multiple offerings that were given. There, there were uh, uh, heap offerings and wave offerings and all these other offerings, free will offerings that had to be offered. And if you were going to give tithe, if you were really going to give a tithe, a tithe of everything, a tithe of your fish, a tithe of your, your hunting expedition, a, a tithe of the fruit of your ground, a, a, a tithe, you would have to, a tithe is not just your paycheck from the store. That's not a tithe. That wasn't a biblical tithe to begin with. But I want you to see this tithe, I, I, there's New Testament principles of giving. Do you know that there is only, I counted them, one, two, three, four passages in the New Testament period that even mention tithing. And three of them are in the Gospels, and we'll go to them, and one of them is in the book of Hebrews, that transition book to the Jew. I'm not saying it's not applicable to us, but he uses that book of Hebrews. You know what you don't find in the Pauline epistles? Period. You know what you don't find in Peter, James, or John? Yes, you find it in Hebrews, and I believe that Paul is the author of Hebrews because of the way he closes out the book of Hebrews with grace. He says he's always closing his books that grace and truth be, grace and this to be to you, and, and he names people and stuff. He closes Hebrews the same way, and, and I think that, that he's the author of Hebrews. I believe that because of the way the book is written. But let me say this, you don't find it in his epistles to the church at all. There's a whole different principle that he begins to bring up, although he doesn't ignore the Old Testament. He will bring up some issues in the Old Testament. So what we see here is this, this passage here is, is it's for a nation, according to verse number 9. Uh, verse number 10, Bring ye in all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now wherewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open... Uh, not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing and there shall uh, not be room enough to receive it. So he just goes on, goes, but I, I, what, this is what I want you to see is that when you're dealing with the tithe, it was given for a nation and one section of that nation in particular. It was given to support one section of that nation. Let's go back to the beginning. When was the tithe instituted? When's the first mention of it? There's a law of for, first mention. Uh, you can go to the first mention. You start to see what it means. And it begins to explain. It's introduced. Uh, Genesis 14. Genesis 14. Look at verse number 17. Genesis 14, 17. He says, and the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return. If you remember, Lot got in trouble and some of them kings and Abraham went down there and delivered him. Look what it says here. And the, the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of... Um, whew, Taylor Laomor. That sounds good. Of the kings that were with him and of the valley of she uh, Sheba... Uh, which is in the king's dell. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth uh, bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High, God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, uh, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine en enemies into thine hand. And he, Abraham, or Abram, uh, gave him tithes of all. 
So here's a, a priest of the Most High God, Melchizedek. We find out that this is associated with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'll turn over to, you didn't know here it was a tent. But if you go to Hebrews chapter 7, verse with verse, we begin to see that it's one-tenth, Hebrews 7. And I'm not against the principle. I, I think if, but I'll say this, if you just give it a, 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 a tenth, uh, I think you miss out on a lot, a, ble- a lot of blessing that, that God would give you being part of ministries. Um, I, I, I think a tenth to me, You know, it varies, you know. It, it could vary. I don't think there's any New Testament foundation for what to give. But God does lay out a principle of a tent that you can draw from and say, you know, if that He expected that of His chosen people, then it's a good starting point. You know, it's, it's not a, I don't think it's a problem, but you've got to make sure you understand who the tithe was for. Look at Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High, who met Abraham returning uh, from the slaughter of the kings, he um, blessed him and blessed him, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being interpreted the king of righteousness, and uh, after that also king of Salem, which is the king of peace. Without, and he goes on, so on and so forth, begins to talk about the tithe that's given there. Let's just read down a little bit, Father. Uh, without father... And without mother, without descent, having neither uh, beginning of days nor end of life, uh, but made like uh, unto the Son of God, abideth in a priesthood continually. Now consider how great uh, this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Verily, uh, they that are of the sons of who? Levi who received the office of the priesthood, have a uh, commandment to take the tithes of the people according to the law. According to the law. According to the law. Are we under the law? So a tithe was a part of the law. What was the purpose of the tithe? You see, you see right there, he's bringing up one of the tribes. Why does he not bring up any other tribe? Who was the tithe for? Who did it take care of? Who didn't have an inheritance among Israel? The Levites didn't have anything amongst Israel. So you know what they did? Rather than hinder them. Now you can see a type there. But let me let you understand something. I'm not a Levitical priest. Is that fair enough to say? I, I, the Bible says he gave some pastors and teachers and, and evangelists uh, and, and, and prophets for the perfecting of the saints. I'm not, I, I'm not a, 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 a priest. Uh, as far as the Levitical priest, I'm not up here offering physical uh, blood sacrifices or none of that. But listen, that tithe was to take care of that group of people. So we can see a principle that's good. Like, so they didn't have to be drawn away from the labors that they were doing. Offering up all those sacrifices, uh, he, they weren't able, they, weren't ha- they didn't have to stop what they were doing and go out and, and, and work and take care of that. They offered for the, whole, the, the sins of the people continually. So it was a lot of labor. And so we see a principle here, but I think it's wrong for you to turn and say that, that, that us as pastors are the same as a priest. I see a type, but again, remember how I cautioned you that, that you be careful that we don't begin to try to make ourselves replace Israel. There is none of us that will replace that nation. None of us can replace His chosen people. Listen, He set them up on purpose in order to teach us lessons, valuable lessons. The lamb that they were offering over and over, all the sacrifices they were offering only foreshadowed Jesus Christ. A multitude of things that those priests were involved in. The priesthood of the Levitical priesthood was only a type of the priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, which is in heaven. So it was an earthly representation of what was going on in heaven. So, we have to be very careful. Let's take a look at this. Leviticus number 27. Leviticus 27. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus 27. Leviticus 27. Look at what it says in verse 30. 
And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at, at all, time, uh, all redeem aught of his tithes, he shall add thereunto a fifth part. Uh, and concerning the tithe of the, of the herd and the flock, even whatsoever passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. It was a tenth. So we see the principle. Numbers, chapter number 18. Numbers 18. Numbers, chapter number 18. Numbers 18. Let's see who it was for. Who did it come from and who was it for? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thus speak unto who? Thus speak unto the Levites, and say unto them, Take ye of the... Who are they taken from? Children of Israel, the tithes which I had given you from them for your inheritance. Then ye shall offer up an heave offering of it uh, for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. So even... Now watch this. If you're going to teach the principle, a lot of, a lot of preachers don't preach this, but I, I, I think it's kind of hypocritical if you don't. But if you're, if you're going to ask the congregation to take a tenth, then you need to give a tenth of what you got if you're going to preach it that way. Or else you're robbing, as far as I'm concerned. I'm just saying if you're going to preach, I don't, I don't preach it that way. But understand this. Even the Levite had to give a tenth of what was given to him. So the tenth was a principle that was there. But notice... Who is the tithe for? Who does it take care of? It takes care of the Levite. Because he didn't have an inheritance. Who did it come from? It came from Israel. It came from the nation of Israel. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter number 12. Deuteronomy 12. Deuteronomy 12. I want you to see that even under the law, the, the, the tithe, we could, we could park here for a long time. I'm not going to park here very long. Deuteronomy 12, look at verse number 10. The tithe was only one offering they gave up. Here's just a small list. There's other lists. It says, For the land whither thou goest. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter number, I'm sorry, 12, verse 10. He says, But when ye go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit, when He giveth you rest from uh, your, all your enemies round about, so that you dwell in safety, then there shall uh, be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause His name to dwell there. Uh, thither shall you bring all I command you, your, notice this, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, your heave offerings of your hand, and all of your choice vows which ye vow unto the Lord. So notice, if you're going to really teach Old Testament giving, see, they like to emphasize tithe, the tenth, the tenth, the tenth, the tenth, the tenth. And listen, I'm not, I'm not against it for a principle, but the truth is, the tithe was only one part. It was, bef it was for the Levite. But notice, notice what the, the offerings that are here. Look at verse number 12. And rejoice you before the... Or actually, let's go back. Let's go back and look at verse number 11. He said, look, burnt offerings, sacrifices, tithes, heath offerings, and vows. Listen, he didn't even, he, I don't even see, well, unless he includes that in the burnt offering, he probably does the free will offering. That's going to be a burnt offering. Um, but notice he's, it's not just a tithe, y'all. It's really not. It's, it's multiple other things that were taken up besides the tithe. I mean, I don't know what percentage it would have been of what they had, but listen, they gave a lot. They gave a lot. Um, so let's look here. Deuteronomy chapter number 14. Deuteronomy 14. Deuteronomy 14. Look at verse number 22. He says, And you shall truly tithe of all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which 
Uh, he shall choose uh, to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, of thy oil, the firstling of thy herds, of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And we could just keep reading down. Listen, you know what? It, it, this tithe thing was not just uh, 10% of my money you know, that I made. Uh, the tithe was 10% right off the top of everything you had. He talked about bringing the first fruits of those tithes even. And so uh, it, was, it was, you know, we, we, we have a habit. We have a habit. Uh, as a young Christian, I, it, it, it took me a long time to, to learn that God is not interested in our leftovers. He's really not. And it manifests a heart problem you got when you just, hey, this is what I got left, here you go. I'm not, listen, I'm not saying God can't use that for His glory and honor and that He won't take uh, what you give and try to use it to promote the gospel. I'm not saying that. But you get to New Testament given. What you get is you see that it's the heart that matters to God. The heart which somebody uh, gives matters to God. It's, uh, it's not just, a, oh, I gave my tenth, there's my check mark, and there's my, my righteousness for the day I'm good with God. Listen, there are some times, there are some times when there are needs so great that God expects us to give sacrificially. And you see it with that widow. That widow given, all those, all those Pharisees in there just casting in much. And that little widow went down in there and she gave of her living. And the Lord said, that she gave more than they all. And they're all puzzled like, well, she only gave two little mites. What exactly? She cast in of her living. And let me say something. God was grateful of that. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. There is a time in the church when there's going to be a need that is so great that it's time to give sacrificially. It's not all the time. Right? But God will honor it if we take care of what He's given us. He expects us to be good stewards with what He's given us. With our money. And listen, I've heard... I, I, I've, I've, I, Listen, God puts people in this church who need to be in this church. He does. And I've heard that from a man in this church for the last three months. And he is absolutely right. God expects us to be stewards of everything he gives us and not to throw our money away. He expects us to take care of this place. He's blessed us with it. And we should love it and want to take care of it. But as far as a, the, a tenth or a tithe, turn to uh, 2 Chronicles 31. And we'll get to the New Testament principles that are taught. Um, 2 Chronicles 31. 2 Chronicles 31. Second Chronicles chapter number 31. Let's look at verse number 1. Now when all this was finished, all Israel were present, uh, that were present went out to the cities of Judah and break the image in pieces and cut down the groves and threw down the high places and, and altars out of Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim also and Manasseh until they had utterly destroyed them all. Uh, then all the children of Israel returned, every man to his possession unto their own cities. And Hezekiah appointed the courses of the priest and the Levites after their courses, every man according to his service, the priest and the Levites uh, for uh, burnt offerings and for peace offerings to minister, uh, to give thanks and to praise in the gates of the, the tents of the Lord. He appointed also the king's portion for his substance to, for the uh, burnt uh, offerings to wit, uh, for the morning and the evening burnt offerings and, and burnt offerings uh, for the Sabbath and for the new moons and for the feast as it is written in the law of the Lord. Moreover, he commanded the people that dwell in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests and the Levites that they might uh, be encouraged in the law of the Lord. And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn, wine, and oil, and honey, 
And of all the increase of the field and the tithe of all the things brought they abundantly. Now let me ask you something. Who is this going to? He already told you multiple times. Verse 4, the priest and the Levites. Verse 2, the priest and the Levites. Okay? But they're bringing in these first fruits, and who's it coming from? Israel. Over and over we see this tithe, and it's all these other offerings. And we see the principles that are, that are good. They're good principles. A tenth, and bringing the first fruit. Not bringing the leftovers. Bringing what first comes out. And um, it's a good principle. It's a good principle. I'm not saying that it's, it's bad, but I'm, what I'm saying is, to the New Testament church... There is no commandment on tithing at all, and you don't see it commanded to anybody but the nation of Israel. That's the only people you ever see it commanded to. And it was under the law. We saw in Hebrews 7 that it was a part of the law. So, you say, Brother Mike, uh, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you preach like this and people won't give, well, shame on them. Shame on them. Shame on them. I'm going to preach the truth, and if you don't give, that's your problem. That's between you and God, and He'll straighten you out. I'm not going to worry about it. I never sit around and worry about stuff like that. God, God hadn't commanded us to preach what will take care of us. He's commanded us to preach the truth. And if you don't want the truth, somebody will. Somebody will. And we've got to tell what's right, what the Bible says. Look at... Um, and you, you say, does, does God care about it? Well, let me just read you some verses. Let me, let me read you how some people uh, thought that that was a big deal. That tenth and that tithe was a big deal. Uh, Matthew chapter number 23. Matthew 23. Verse number 23. What's important to God? That's it. It's a heart. Look at this. Matthew 23, verse 23. He says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted. Now watch, watch. Was the tithe a part of the law? Yes, because he said you've omitted the weightier matters of the law. So it was part of the law that was given to Israel. Look at this. Judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought to you have done and not to leave the other done. You know what he said? You need to give. But if you really want to know what's important to me, it's these weightier matters. Judgment, mercy, and faith. Because listen, this is what I know. What is he on these, these Pharisees about? He's on them about, hey, how you clean up the outside and you ain't taking care of what's on the inside of you. And you know what? Listen, if you ever get to the inside of a person, the outside will naturally do what it's supposed to do. Listen, the outside will want to give everything it can possibly give for the glory of God. You, but listen, what is important, that inside, the Holy Spirit works on hearts from the inside out. Listen, I don't, I, you're not going to hear me uh, constantly harp on this thing about dress, constantly harp on this thing about certain things on the outside. Uh, I'll mention them on occasions because they're right and there's biblical teaching on them and we've got to hit on them. But this is what I know about a person. If you ever get the heart right on the inside, if you can pound away what's on the inside and get them to love God and get them to desire what He wants, all that will change naturally. Listen, they'll come just like Charles did, asking, asking, well, I don't know how, I don't know, what, where do I start? Where, I want to give to the church. That's what he told me. I want to give to the church, but I just need to know how to do it. I really don't know. You know, listen, the principle is what's on the inside. Luke 18. Luke 18. Luke chapter number 18. So we see the Pharisees were putting the emphasis... 
on the outside. The Lord didn't, told, didn't tell him, don't, don't take care of the temple. Don't care, take care of the needs there with the tithe. He just said, look, uh, there, there's some weightier matters than that. Those are all things on the outside people see you give, and, uh, and you can get glory and glory in what you've done over that. But the truth is, he, he's sitting there trying to deal with them about what's on the inside of them. Look at this. Verse number 9, And he spake this parable unto certain which trust in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the, into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, one a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, I thank uh, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. I fast... Uh, I, I, I fast twice in, in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not, so li uh, not lift up so much his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God be merciful to me a sinner. You know what I didn't tell about this publican here? I didn't tell how much he gave. But you know what? That Pharisee wanted to make sure everybody knows I give a tithe of all I have. But I want you to notice what the Lord dealt with him about. I tell you, verse 14, that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. He that humble himself shall be exalted. Is Brother Mike saying don't give to the church? Is Brother Mike saying you're like a Pharisee if you put something in the offering plate? I'm not saying that at all. What I'm telling you is this. What God desires of us as New Testament, born again, blood bought, blood washed, forgiven sinners that are in His body that are going to be the bride of Christ, He wants us to have a heart that loves Him and what is in our heart to do to please Him. You know what, David? Something came into David's heart one day, and he had a heart that was minded to build God a temple. And you know what? Because of that, God said that that, that throne would not depart from David just over something real simple, him saying, I just want to build God a place. I got a house. I want God to have a house. Isn't that something? God is interested in what's on the inside. What's in your heart. Listen, we know there's needs. Don't you want people to get saved on foreign fields? I do. I do. I, I, listen, this, this, this church, I, though it's small, supports missionaries. That's a blessing. I, the missionaries come through. i got missionary friends that are up on that board. They say, I can't believe you. Y'all support all them. I say, well, thank the Lord. But you know what? I feel so strongly about it that, that I, I, I support them myself. And, and listen, I'm not telling any... Listen, I don't tell any of y'all to do that. You know? But listen, I, I, I think at some point we have to be willing to give up whatever we got to give up for the sake... Listen, everything you got down here is going to burn. Everything you own is, is going to pass away. It's, you're not even going to have it. But you know what we, we have a tendency to do? We fight tooth and nail over stuff that don't matter. Listen, I, there's, a, there's a guy at Brother Stafford's. I love that man to death. His name is Jack. He's an older man. He's probably, I don't know, Jack, probably in his 70s. And um, there was some church members chattering with me one day. And I just overheard them kind of talking to somebody behind, beside me after they got done chattering. Man, that Jack, man. Did you see how much he, he gave? And Jack is very humble. He's quiet. He keeps to himself. You don't see him advertising nothing. Man, did you see how much he gave? Oh, you see? Yeah. And I got to talking to some of them. And, and I, said, I said, that guy's a blessing, ain't he? He said, you know what? That guy lives in an old, dinky trailer that is run down on the side of a mountain and he would rather give his money to take care of the church and missionaries than to fix his own house. 
Because you know what Jack's attitude about it is? I'm just, I'm about to leave here anyway. I'm about to see the Lord anyway. I ain't, I ain't, I ain't got nothing here that wants, makes me want to stay here. Guy's just a blessing. People don't understand this. People don't understand this. And I'm not saying young people don't give. But the backbone of the church when it comes to giving is generally the older folks. Because they've learned over the years that God has honored that. And God has blessed their life because they were willing to sacrifice when it was necessary. I guarantee you somebody sacrificed building this church. Right, brother? I guarantee you some pocketbooks were empty building this church. I guarantee you some people were tight trying to build this church, trying to lay the foundation, trying to get the walls up, trying to get the roof up. I guarantee you there were some people who, who made great sacrifices for that. Listen, that's how God wants us all to be. He don't want just some of us to be that way. He wants all of us to be willing to do whatever it takes. And it don't always come all the time. It's seasons when there's a need. And we'll see that principle is taught in the Scriptures in the New Testament. Look at 1 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians chapter number, or actually let's go to 2 Corinthians 9 first. 2 Corinthians 9, New Testament teaching. I'll try to make this as quick as I can. Hopefully I can um, hem this up here in the next 15 minutes or so. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, For as touching uh, the ministry, 2 Corinthians 9, for as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write unto you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, uh, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia is ready, was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. He says, Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting should have been in vain in this behalf, that, as I said, you may be ready, lest happily if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that is, we, we say not ye, but should be ashamed in the same confident uh, boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye, have, uh, ye had noticed before, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not a, a, as of covetousness. But I say this, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he what? Purposed in, purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Listen, when the Bible says that God loves something, a, 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 a pastor may say, I heard a pastor say this one time, and, and it resonated with me. He said, many people say you need to give till it hurts. And he said, the Bible says you need to give till it feels good. Because the Bible says God loveth a cheerful giver. He don't want you to put nothing in here or give to the church or however you choose to do it. He's not wanting you to do it begrudgingly. He's wanting you to do it willingly with a, with a heart that desires to support the work. Look what it says here. Paul is just uh, encouraging them. He says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you that, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound in every good work. As it is written, he, that, uh, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now notice the context. Who are they taking up this offering for? Verse number 1, For as touching the ministering to the saints, what you see is, there's some saints that are a little less fortunate in this area. Listen, y'all. He's not taking up this offering for the preacher. He's not taking up this offering for the light bill. He's coming through saying, look, we have some saints that have some needs. 
We'll get to the other stuff in just a minute. Just, I'm not excluding that. But what I want you to see is there are times when God expects us to take care of each other. Our giving should not only support this physical work here, keep the lights on, keep the gospel tracks back there, uh, whatever we got to do for the outreach, all kind of other stuff, uh, uh, gas bill, uh, all kind of stuff that has to be paid. Repairs on the church. We, how many of you like to go to the bathroom and have toilet paper? I like to go to the bathroom and have toilet paper. I like to wash my hands, and I want you to wash your hands because I don't want to shake your hand if you didn't wash yours. But all of that stuff costs money. Right? But he's not even talking about any of that here. He's talking about some saints that have a great need. And you know what he's saying? He's saying, look, you sow sparingly. You're going to reap sparingly. You know, God has a, an incredible way of putting you in the same position as other people. He has an incredible way of making you feel their pain when you got an attitude about helping or you got an attitude about what the decision they're making, God has a strange way of turning the tables and making it where you got a need now. You better think about that for a little bit. Listen, if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. You sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. And I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in my life. But listen, don't sow with a bad heart. You make sure that you got a good heart about what you give. And you give cheerfully. All right, look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Philippians chapter 4. Look at verse number 15. He says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel... When I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in... Did you catch that? Did you catch what he said? No other church even spoke to me about giving and receiving but you. You know what that means? Somebody wasn't doing it. I'm just saying. Read, it, read what's there. Don't read what's not there. Look what it says here. He says, For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again to my necessity, not because I desired a gift, but I desired fruit uh, that may abound to your account. So, you know, Paul said, Look, you, you gave to my necessity. I had necessities. You gave to me. And notice he's desiring fruit that may abound to their account. Listen, he, that gift, he's desiring that God will bless them for being a blessing to him, he was in a hard time. Here Paul the Apostle is in a hard time. And they're given to his necessity. He says, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Papaditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a, a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing unto God. Do you see how one passage says, that God loveth a cheerful giver. You, anytime the Bible says something that God loves, you better take note of it. But you know what it says here? With such sacrifices, they're well pleasing to God. Anytime the Bible notes something that pleases God, that He loves, you ought to take note of that. You know what? God loves it. God loves it. When your brethren have a need, when a missionary on the field has a need, when another pastor has a need, when a brother over here has a need, and we desire to fill that need. Nobody else gave but this church right here. And the Bible took note that it was well-pleasing to God. I want to be that church. That's the church I want to be. I want to be that church where God is well pleased with what we're doing. We're seeing a need and we're trying to fill it. Listen, the needs will come up. And we need, we need to be a part of it. I want our church to be right in the middle of that. But notice what it says in verse number 19. But my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Notice what he says. But now unto God and our, uh, 
Our Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. He goes on, salutes the saints there. But notice what he says here. My God's... A lot of people take that out of context. They only isolate that verse. They say, my God shall supply all your need. You know what Paul is saying here? Look, you took care of the need that I had, and you rest assured about one thing, God will take note of it, and He'll supply your needs. That's the way it works. That's the sowing and the reaping. That's the way it works. New Testament doctrine. 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16. It's funny, I had a preacher one time tell me if I preached this that I wouldn't have a church, they wouldn't support me. And I said, well, I ain't worried about it. I, <laughs> I can work. If they're that low down, I can work. I'm not worried about it. But I said, you know, the people will give if their heart is right. All you got to do is tell them the truth. All you got to do is tell them the truth. Look at 1 Corinthians 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, who is the collection for? Who is this collection for? It's for the saints. As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has prospered him. And therefore, uh, that there be no uh, gatherings when I come, and when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to uh, bring your liberality to, unto Jerusalem. So there were some saints at Jerusalem that had a need. And you know what Paul's doing? He's going over there to Galatia. And they want to supply that need. And that church has, has stepped up to the plate and said, hey, we want to supply that need for them, them poor saints up there at Jerusalem. And they took up a collection and he's just passing by. All he's doing is coming by and taking that collection and he's going to bring it to Jerusalem when he goes up. And that, that's the way you see New Testament. Listen, do you remember in the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira, you remember the problem with Ananias and Sapphira? It's not that, it's not that they, listen, it's not that they couldn't have done whatever they wanted to do with their land. It was theirs. It's the pretense. But you remember what the saints were doing before then? They, were, they knew some brethren had needs. And when they got saved, they had all these possessions and lands and all this other stuff. They began to sell some of those lands and give that to take care of the needs of the poor brethren that were in the church. That's the way a church is supposed to work. We are supposed to take care of each other and the needs that we have. We're to comfort each other. We're to encourage each other. We're to love each other. We are supposed to be family. It's not your family and your four and no more. Listen, we are in this together. We're going to spend eternity together. You are my brother. You are my sister in Christ. And our Father is God. And we're going to spend eternity with Him. And we need to take care of each other on the way there. That's what it's about. What it's about? Listen, I, I'm not. The Bible tells us very carefully the labor. It says I'm not to be greedy of filthy lucre. Evidently, there's going to be some money given if it tells me that. But you know what? It gives me a warning. It gives me a strong warning that that's not what I'm. The Bible says, "Labor not to be rich." Listen, we're not to labor uh, for this world's wealth. We're to labor for the spiritual wealth that's in heaven. Last, last passage, 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians 9. Look at verse number 7. 1 Corinthians 9. There is a principle that would, would encourage you to take care of your preacher. And it's laid out right here. And take care of not just your preacher, but all of them that preach the gospel. All of them that are involved in, in, in being heads of, uh, uh, of congregations or, or missionaries, what not. Uh, there's a principle here. And you'll see that principle laid out in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, Whoso go, who, who goeth to warfare any time 
at his own charges. They don't. They go at the charge of the government. Right? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? I plant a garden every year. I'm eating the fruit thereof. I give a lot of it away, but I'm eating the fruit thereof. Look at this. Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? So uh, he's going to go and reference the law. Look at this. Verse number 9. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. Uh, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. He says, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we reap your carnal things? Now he's talking about, uh, well, we'll finish reading. You'll see who he's talking about. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. You know what Paul is saying? We, we, could, we could take of you. It, it, listen, here we are laboring, and we're, we're, we, it's right for us to receive from you uh, of our labors and be taken care of you. But you know, Paul's attitude is this, I don't want to be a burden to the churches for the sake of the gospel. So you saw Paul doing without on purpose. Let me say something to you. This is not, I see a multitude of pastors that their goal is to be rich and wealthy. Let me let you understand something. That's not one of my goals at all. And listen, I'm not interested in, 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 in having houses and lands and all this other stuff that, that are going to be gone when I'm gone anyway. And Paul had the right attitude. He didn't want to be a burden to the church. And the right, the right attitude for a preacher to take is he doesn't want to be a burden. Paul said, Paul said that there was times in his life he was lacking. There were times, he said, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. There were, there were low times in his life and there were high times in his life, but he was content. He said, uh, having food and raiment, therewith be content. And yet we have so much more than that. We have so much more than that. We do. But there is a principle here taught, uh, but for a preacher to have the attitude almost like to say, you better. Let me say something to you. It's just by the grace of God that this man is standing in front of you. If Jesus hadn't have passed by my way, I would have been in de dead and in hell today. It's just by God's grace. Whenever we get to a point where we think that we are everything, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Let me say, we're so self-centered. But Paul had the right attitude. He had a good balance on it. I don't want to burden you, but the ox does eat the corn. He does eat of the corn that's there. And notice what it says here. He says, um, verse 13, Do not uh, they which minister uh, about holy things live of the things of the temple? He's talking about the Levites here. He's given an illustration using the Old Testament. Um, and they which wait on, at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the, the Lord ordained that they that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And he goes on and, and lays out the, the rest of the argument. Listen, brethren. Listen. I pray that your heart is right when you give. And you give because you love this church. You want to see it keep going on. But one thing I'm not going to preach I'm not going to preach that you rob God if you don't give a tenth. I'm not. You say, I don't like it. I'm tough. I don't care. Because I want this church to have the right attitude when they give. 
because God blesses that. But I will warn you about something. The New Testament principle is not like the tithe. It's a matter of reaping and sowing. God has given you a promise that He will honor what you give and that's New Testament giving. The best way I can show you. But we see that tithe. I'm, listen, I'm not against the principle, y'all. And I'm not going to hang a preacher that, that believes in giving a tithe if he wants to preach that and he thinks that's, he's misapplied it because that goes to Israel. He's misapplied it. But I'm not going to give him a hard time um, as long as he, he, he is trying to, to get his congregation to be involved and he encourages the right heart in them. Listen, I, the last thing I want you to do is be up here being begrudging because you think that you've got to give a tenth and if you don't, God's going to hate you. It don't work like that. It don't work like that. But if you'll, let's be honest for a second. If you're giving with the right heart, a tenth is going to be way back there in the rear view mirror. It's going to be way back there. And, and you, listen, because you're just going to give. Whatever need needs to be met, you'll give it. You'll give it. And you won't expect anything back. You just want to be pleasing to God. It's the heart. So let's work on our heart. I hope that's a blessing to you. Um, is there any questions on, on this issue? Did I, is there something that I missed? Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir.